Well, here we are again. It's a fall preview for the Academy for Lifelong Learning, and my name is Allison Majora. I am our program administrator. And uh, just to go through the nuts and bolts of things, uh, as I usually do, this is our wonderful group at Western Washington University. That's who I work for. And uh, this is our team of many people, uh, only a handful of which help you out every time you're calling in a panic and your registration isn't working. And speaking of people that you might talk to when you're upset or you're happy, <laughs> is this wonderful gal right here. This is Mary McLaughlin. And uh, she is our main program assistant that answers the ALL line. So I'm going to let her chat with you for just a minute and introduce the registration process. Mary. Like Allison said, my name is Mary McLaughlin. And when you call into ALL, I'll be the person you're talking to. So just so you have a face with the name on the phone. Um, just to go over a little bit about registration, um, you can, the easiest way to register is online. It's quick fast at uh, www.edu slash ALL. Um, and if you're not comfortable with going online to register, the uh, registration sheet in the back of your catalog is uh, easy to pull out and mail in. Uh, just remember, if you are a new member, if you have not taken any classes with us before, to sign up on the back side of that sheet with all your information so we can get you registered um, and going. Uh, the preview table for registration is located where it was last year, right at the right through these doors, and will be open when the preview is over. Um, we do ask that if you would fill out your registration form before you come to the table, so you have all your classes, your credit card, or your check ready. It will just speed up the line a little bit quicker. Um, and we do accept credit cards, cash, and checks. So welcome and enjoy the preview. Thank you, Mary. Uh, one thing that uh, hopefully most of you have, if you haven't, are using email, is uh, you're getting our monthly newsletter. It's where you find out up-to-date information about what's going on, featured courses that uh, we might be enticing you with. And uh, so that is always accessible on the front page of our website, uh, and also direct it to your email inbox if you would like us to send it to you. So if you find that you're not getting it now and you would like it, Please make sure to add your email to that contact sheet out front, um, and we'll get that to you. It comes out usually around the middle of the month. Membership cards, uh, as we usually do, it's $45 for an annual membership. You can register for a membership with your registration for classes, either online or on the registration form in the back of your catalog. Uh, and then you'll get your membership for the year discounts um, on courses and excursions, of course. And then um, also some great discounts at uh, Western, up at the um, Wade, Wade King Recreation Center, and also at Village Books, they've got some um, nice little discounts, even on your birthday, free cup of coffee. <laughs> uh, and a quick side note about memberships, I've had a handful of people um, have some issues with online registration, and we're not quite sure what's happening there with the system, just as a side note about our registration system. We're looking at something new in the coming future, so uh, hopefully in the next year or so, we'll switch over a new to a new system. Hopefully that will be seamless to you and you won't really notice much of a difference, except that it should function much better, hopefully from your end and our end. So please don't hesitate to reach out to us anytime if you do find you're having issues, you're having, um, you haven't got your card yet and you paid back in the beginning of August. Um, there's been kind of some weird glitches, and so I want to make sure that we get all that settled for you. Please don't hesitate to, to let us know, please. Program calendar, I usually put this up for you guys. It's a, just a quick printout PDF document for you if you want to have something handy to get a nice visual of when the classes are laid out. Help match that up with your own personal schedules. Spring course locations, uh, we're taking great advantage of the Bellingham Cruise Terminal again, which is where we are now today. Gateway Center is a new spot. We took advantage of that last term, and that's over by Boomers off Samish Way and Ellis. Um, it's a decent little spot. They have uh, free coffee and tea that they provide to us, um, so it's a, also an enticing uh, location if, if they're on time with it all, right? So let us know if you ever have any issues with any of the venues, and we appreciate your feedback and all of the surveys that you do. Urban Street Methodist Church, the library presentation room, the community co-op will be a special one, uh, and that's for our foraging class. 
and the Willows. We'll have one class at the Willows as well. Volunteer opportunities. Uh, we're doing pretty good so far. Uh, the excursions committee could use uh, one or two more members. So if it's something you've been thinking about or you've been an avid um, excursion attendee in the past, please keep that in mind and let us know if you're interested. There's also some volunteer forms on the back, uh, outside on the front table there, if you're interested in leaving your contact information in that way. Board of directors, we're always thinking about it. each new year we have to recruit new members. So uh, something we like to do in terms of having conversations with people, being a little more fruitful about that, but if you've ever served on a board or you've been an avid uh, member of ALL for some time, like to take courses and you're interested in more of the governance aspect, please don't hesitate to reach out as well. You can use the same form right on front. And then videographer, photographer, we did have somebody record the uh, spring preview for us. He was a volunteer. He's out of town this time, and so we've got some great Western students here to help us out recording today. But if that's your forte and you just like to take pictures, I've had a couple of you share your own pictures from excursions uh, or classes that you take, and that's okay too. You don't have to volunteer yourself, maybe just your pictures, and we'd be uh, grateful to give you credit for those. Again, that's just basic information. You can also sign up uh, if you want to volunteer. You can sign up online on the resources page. So big thank you. If everybody will just give a short round of applause for all the volunteers who have helped. Thank you. And now that wraps it up for the nuts and bolts, and I'm going to introduce Barb Evans, our excursion chair. We, we have some wonderful excursions planned for this fall and we hope to see a lot of you at them. But before I talk about those, let me introduce the people who worked so hard to plan these excursions for us. Yvonne Dean, if you'd stand, please. Yvonne Dean, Jean Gorton, Jane Clarkin. Uh, Mary Sadler is not here today, and Jeanette Lisbon Young. These are the people who will be leading the excursions <clears throat> this fall. Now, to the excursions. The first one is uh, a trip down to the Seattle uh, Tunnel Project in Pioneer Square. You can see the immovable Bertha. <laughs> when we started planning this excursion, we were really hoping and it was a long time ago, and we were really hoping that uh, Bertha would be moving again, but not to be. But uh, there is a, a marvelous information center called Milepost 31 where you can see about the project and uh, the planning for it, as well as some information and photos about Seattle's changing landscape. Then we'll have lunch at FX McCrory's. And then an opportunity that some of you may not even know exists. The Klondike Gold Rush Historical Park has a branch in Seattle where you can learn about the importance of that gold rush to the Seattle area. And then finally ending up with the Smith Tower and an opportunity to see the marvelous uh, Chinese room. The next trip is a wine trip, and I know how most of you don't really like to do those. <laughs> so anyway, this is just a little bit different. It's a one-day wine trip to Woodenville, and uh, this trip is being led by Jeanette Lisbon Young, um, who found the owner of Wine Dirt Wine Dirt to Wine Tours, uh, who offered to take us on this excursion to Woodenville to a few of the wineries where we'll have an opportunity to taste and purchase, of course. And there'll be a box lunch provided with this trip. It should be a lot of fun, especially going with someone whose family has been in the wine growing <coughs> business for, or the wine producing business for uh, three generations. The next one is, is a trip down to McIntyre Hall to see Aida. And I know many of you have gone on our other trips to McIntyre Hall, and it's always a good show. And again, we're going on opening night. Uh, there will be a pre-excursion lecture on Tuesday, October 28th, 
be presented by Mitchell Kahn, who is the uh, director of the Skagit Opera, also a very knowledgeable person. Um, the uh, next two trips are both plays at the Rep. And we are very, very fortunate here. These plays, all the way in the Great Society, the two plays about Lyndon Johnson's presidency were developed with the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. The first one was commissioned by them all the way, and it also won the Tony Award for the best drama this year. So this is a really great opportunity to see some fine theater. The second play, The Great Society, uh, was commissioned by the Seattle Rep, but both of these plays were produced uh, in conjunction with the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. Uh, when we go to see all, <coughs> all the Way, we will go to the SAM first, and there's not a specific tour. There are several really interesting exhibits there, and you'll have time just to wander around the museum and then have lunch before we go to the play. Uh, when we go to see the Great Society, we'll go to Pike Place Market first, where you'll have some time to do maybe a little last-minute Christmas shopping, have lunch before we go to the rep. As Allison pointed out, we could use a few more members uh, on the excursion committee. So if you enjoy going on excursions, we would appreciate it if uh, some of you might volunteer to help us. It's a lot of fun, and you usually are responsible for planning one excursion, but we would not uh, require that of you the very first time you come. But please think about it, and. Uh, let me know or call the office and let them know. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Um, the curriculum committee thinks they have a very exciting and very uh, list of, of courses for you this year. And um, for the most part, we're going to follow the catalog. However, on the first one, you'll see that the, the first several are, are instructors that have to leave fairly soon. So we're going to take them out of order, but you'll find the page number to look at in your catalog down at the bottom right side of this, of this slide. Um, the first one that we will hear is Michael Johnson, who's going to talk to us about the 100th anniversary of World War I. Hello, my name is Michael Johnson. I've uh, taught two classes at AL before this, one on Jefferson Bible, the second on history of presidential elections. I hope you will join me in our, in our discussion of the First World War. One of the ways that history fails the American people is by not personalizing what happened. The amount of suffering in the First World War is inconceivable. Obviously, this is a very serious subject. So what this, this class will focus, focus on is what happened to individuals. This is not about kings. This is not about generals. This is about what it's like to live in a trench. This is what it's like to sit behind a machine gun and kill hundreds of men. This is what it's like to work in an ammunition factory in Britain or Germany. Some of the women there were as young as 14 years old. What it was like to work covered by gunpowder every single day that you worked. What it was like to be on a ship that was sunk by a U-boat. I want to bring people's stories. I will, I will cover the large aspects of the war, military aspects, how the war went back and forth. But I'll also uh, let people know what happened on the Eastern Front, you can see there on the map of Poland, what happened in Africa, where several hundred thousand people were killed, what happened in the Middle East. The second goal of this class was to bring the, second, the First World War into historical perspective. If you look at the map, especially of the Middle East today, you will see the direct result of what happened in World War I and the treaties that came out. Nations like Syria, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Israel, all come out of the First World War. So we will look at see at how that happened. And I will focus on what I call four precedents. And those precedents are, one, the invention of modern genocide by the Ottoman Empire against the Armenian people with the murder of between 500 and 800,000 people. 
of the perpetrators of that genocide, at least 99.9% walked. A literal handful of people were punished for this crime. I will also discuss the precedent of going from what was fought before the war, even at the start of the war, to be a war crime. Unrestricted submarine warfare, where you sink liners full of people, including women and children, like the Lusitania. The third precedent will be, let's see, what is the third precedent? <laughs> Why politicians got to the point where they were willing to sacrifice millions and millions of men's lives for very limited political gains. And last, again, how the peace treaties affect not just the Middle East, but Europe and even the United States. Very serious subject, very important subject. I hope you will join me. Thank you. Our second uh, course is also a serious one. It's called Exploring Health Fraud by Jeannie Freeman. Jeannie? I'm glad to see you all here today. I am excited, um, and I thank you for letting me go earlier on in the presentation. Today is my birthday. My husband's waiting outside to take me out for my birthday, so <laughs> I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you for a whole three minutes. <laughs> but I'm Dr. Jeannie Freeman, and I teach up at Western, and before I begin telling you about the class that I'm going to be teaching, I have a few questions for you. So raise your hand if any of these things have ever happened to you. How many of you have ever felt a little pain in your head from time to time? <laughs> Maybe a little gastrointestinal discomfort? <laughs> Maybe a little pain in the leg or in the knee or something like that? Well, I'd like to share with you the amazing discovery that I had in my research from this magical land of Wu, also known as WWU, about this thing that we have that we can do to cure all your ailments. The miracle cure. The absolute perfect cure for everything that is out there. What we're going to talk about in my class are the red flag warnings of health fraud. How can you identify with all the different advertisements on TV and in magazines and on the internet of the material that's out there? How can you tell, are they telling you the truth? How do I know? How can I demystify the research? Because they're all in white lab coats and they've got some sort of articles that are out there and they say the research proves this to you. So we're going to demystify that. That's what we're going to be taking on in the first class. The second day that we have class is going to be what you want me to focus on. So coming to the first class, I'm going to ask you to bring forward your questions so that I can go and do some research for you and I can help with that. And then we can demystify that together and bring it all around so that you can feel confident as you move forward in identifying what might be the good qualities of health information, what might be the poor qualities of health information, so that literally you're not taken to the cleaners. That's what I have for you. Excellent. I think that's a topic we all are going to need to to learn about the, so much advertising now on television for medicines. Uh, again, uh, uh, we're out of order, but Chuck Anholt has to leave, and he's going to speak to us about his class on agriculture, food for thought, page 14. Well, Jeannie's uh, lucky she still celebrates her birthday. <laughs> I was born and raised on a dairy farm. I spent 25 years in South Asia, starting with the Peace Corps. A couple weeks ago, by the way, we celebrated our 50th anniversary, going off to Pakistan to save the bloody world. <laughs> I don't think we quite made it. But anyway, it's a wonderful reunion with our Peace Corps group. But you know what? They all got old. I don't know where that happened. Anyway, I spent my whole life in South Asia, Bangladesh, India, Sri Lanka, um, Pakistan, Nepal, working with small farmers on agriculture development issues. I want to share that experience with you. I want to put part of this uh, class in, the, in a global perspective. We've got 7 billion people in the world today. We're going to have 9 billion plus in 2050. They're going to be wealthier. Of course we want people not to be poor. But when they're not poor, they're going to consume more. How is that possible? 
we think between now and 2050, we'll need about 100% more food. What does that mean to our resource base, the Earth? We're going to look at that question, see what options are uh, in front of us. There aren't any silver bullets. Yes, we want better plants, disease resistant, drought resistant, but technology isn't the only answer. We have incredible policy and institutional reforms dealing with the tragedy of the commons, internalizing the cost of pollution on farms incentives for better practices. Those are the kind of issues I want to get us acquainted about and talk about and ask questions about and how we meet our needs, food needs, by 2050 without destroying the world. The second part, I want to talk about U.S. agriculture. U.S. agriculture is the single biggest agriculture system in the world. It's pretty complex. It's pretty awesome. It's got some huge problems. We're going to look at the complexities of U.S. agriculture. We're going to look at some of the myths about U.S. agriculture. A common one is corporate farming. Well, yes, 4% of our farms are corporations. 90% of those are family corporations. We're going to look at what happens over time in our agricultural system. Of course, I'm going to talk about choices, public policy choices, and I want to talk about the 2014 Farm Bill. Well, we did get rid of direct payments, huh? (laughs) But we've got a Farm Bill that's a trillion dollars over 10 years, 80% of which goes to food stamps. I asked Senator Cantwell one time, does the Farm Bill carry the food stamps or does the food stamps carry the Farm Bill? She didn't answer, but she did smile. Okay, we're going to talk about a lot of interesting things. I look forward to sharing my experiences with you. Thank you very much. Um, Now we're back to our regular order. Um, So go to page four, and we're going to hear from Abe Lloyd on alpine ethnobotany and foraging. This is for fall. Uh, By the way, he'll also be doing a spring class for the, the food that we could forage in the spring. Um, he's going to show us why we're so fortunate to live where we do. Um, he's an authority on native vegetation, especially edible native vegetation, and uh, he's going to give us some really useful knowledge. Abe? Great, thank you. <laughs> Brought some props with me. Um, So my name's Abe, I grew up here in Bellingham and I teach a course up at Western in Natural History and another course at Whatcom Community College in Ethnobotany. And um, I actually think it's really appropriate that I'm going right after the farm speaker because my topic is also really focused in on food. And um, we're gonna start up right away next week. Uh, The first session of this two-part course is uh, Wednesday, September 17th. Um, and then the following Saturday, we'll be heading up to um, the mountains to actually pick some berries. So in the first session on Wednesday, we're gonna be exploring food, indigenous foods, from a little bit more of a philosophical point of view. So um, I guess in my journey um, to understand native plants, I've um, come to realize that these food systems, these indigenous food systems, are actually radically different than our agricultural food systems and that perhaps we as settler um, people in, this, in North America have a lot to learn um, from these indigenous food systems. So we're gonna explore um, how the Native Americans in the Pacific Northwest traditionally manage some of these foods for both um, production and for sustainability. And um, we'll be focusing in on the Alpine communities. Um, and then on Saturday, we get, a, get our hands dirty and our fingers sticky and our lips uh, coated with sweet flavors of uh, huckleberries and blueberries, we're gonna go up to the mountains and actually do some harvesting. Um, And then uh, we'll spend the morning doing that and then come back to the co-op and um, cook up some tasty dishes with the berries that we pick. So we're really fortunate in this region to have a huge diversity of blueberries and huckleberries. 
And I think some of the finest, actually, of the, of the blueberries and huckleberries in North America are found here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, for example, one of our blueberries is called Cascade Blueberry. The, the scientific name is Vaccinium Deliciosum. So <laughs> it's uh, very tasty. Um, so please join me uh, this coming week, um, Wednesday and Saturday. Thank you. By the way, if you're interested in this particular class, you need to sign up immediately because, uh, uh, as you can see, the class is coming up very quickly. Uh, the next one is, I'm sure almost all of you know our very busy, active David Drummond, our naturalist. He's taught with us for 16 years. He's taught with us for 16 years. Um, he, unfortunately, couldn't be here today. He is uh, leading a naturalist trip on a ship around Greenland. But he uh, wanted me to tell you how sorry he was that uh, he couldn't be here. And he sent me a little paragraph that he said to please read to you. He said, um, spring sunshine signals local bird life into action. If you've ever wanted to learn more about their field identity, their breeding, bioecology, habitats, amazing behaviors, and well, here's your chance. We will explore seven families with 28 species through lively PowerPoint discussions, audio vocalizations, and hard copy references uh, in two classes, and then put our new knowledge to work in an easy walking half-day field trip. Join us to jab the deep intellect of jays, the wild ways of woodpeckers, and the quickness of the Queensland. You can tell he likes poetry. Um, so we do hope that you will attend this class. Uh, he has quite a following of uh, all of you, as, as you know if you've ever been in one of his classes. So we hope to see you there. Our next uh, lecturer we are so fortunate to have. He uh, came from the East Coast and volunteered. Uh, uh, he had done ALL classes in other places, uh, but he really wanted to do them here as well. So. Um, he is going to start with the Epic of Gilgamesh as the first class, and then he is going to go on and with another classic, um, the Aeneid. So, Andrew? Yes. Um, at this point, I've done three uh, classes for ALL here on the Greek gods, on the Iliad, and on the Odyssey. And all three classes have in common various things. They all deal with old stuff uh, that is ancient Greece. They were all quite long, five to six sessions. And they, at least in the case of the Iliad and the Odyssey, they involved a considerable amount of reading. Now, I think there may be people in this room who have no prejudice against old stuff. In fact, they might like to explore some old stuff, but they're a little bit wary about a commitment to a whole number of six sessions and a, and a lot of reading. In which case, this Gilgamesh course is the course for you. Uh, it's really old. In fact, the, epic, the Babylonian the epic of Gilgamesh is at least a thousand years older than Homer. So we're, we're, it's a very old. But the, uh, it's very short. It's about 55 pages in the edition that we'll be using. And the course is two sessions long. And it's a Wednesday and a Friday, I think, so it's half a week. So even if you discover it's not your cup of tea, it's going to be over before you know it. Although I think, <laughs> I think you will probably um, enjoy it. It's a wonderful, amazing work. It's a work so, uh, so ancient can have such an appeal. Uh, Gilgamesh was this legendary uh, king of the city of Uruk in Mesopotamia. Uh, he was uh, part divine, two thirds divine, which is in proportion when you think about it, but she was so energetic as a result, he was driving his city crazy, and so the gods created a companion for him to go off and do her own deeds with, just to keep him busy. And that companion was this wonderful character named Enkidu, who was a wild man, all covered with hair, living out with wild animals, and then he gets tamed and civilized, and in that process, by the way, a prostitute plays a very important role. Um, and he ends up becoming Gilgamesh's friend, and they go off on heroic exploits. Uh, but then Enkidu dies. 
Um, and Gilgamesh is so overcome with grief at the, at the death of his friend that he goes off on a quest to find the secret of immortality. To find out what happens on that quest, you'll have to sign up for the class, uh, which uh, meets at the end of, uh, of well, yeah, yes, yeah, so the beginning of October. All right, at the next class. <laughs> um, let's say you did sign up for the Gilgamesh class. You thought that sounds sort of interesting, and it's only two sessions. If you decided that it really was sort of fun to explore this old stuff, maybe you then would be in the market for a longer, bigger uh, piece of, uh, of old stuff, namely Virgil's um, Aeneid. I'm just curious how many people in this uh, room took Latin in high school or in college. I suspected that there would be a fair number of, of hands, because I mean, Latin used to be a regular element in, in high school curriculum. If you didn't do more than a couple of years of Latin, you probably read some of Virgil's Aeneid, uh, because it's a standard uh, reading text. The, one of the amazing things about this poem is that it became a standard school text, basically uh, the generation after Virgil's death. It began being used in schools right away, instant classic. Uh, the poem, the Aeneid, that name means the poem about Aeneas, just the way that Homer's Odyssey means the poem about uh, Odysseus. Um, and in this poem, what Virgil is, one thing he's doing is basically turning himself into the Roman Homer. He's doing in Latin, the Latin language, the kinds of things that Homer did in his epic, in his epic poem. Aeneas is actually a character in, in Homer's uh, Iliad, but Virgil, but he was also traditionally regarded by the Romans as their ultimate ancestor. So what Virgil has uh, done in, does in this poem is to tell how Aeneas actually survives, along with some other Trojans, survives the sack of Troy when the Greeks won the Trojan War, and how he goes off into exile, leading his people. They wander around the Mediterranean for a number of years. They end up in North Africa for a while. He becomes romantically involved with the queen of, uh, of Carthage named Dido. But his destiny is ultimately to get, him to, uh, to, get to Italy where he will begin the process that centuries later will lead to the founding of Rome. Uh, Virgil supposedly worked on this poem for nine, uh, nine years, and people knew that he was working on it, and there was a lot of curiosity as to what he was producing. One man was particularly per uh, uh, curious, and that was Caesar Augustus, uh, first of the Roman emperors. He traced his lineage back to Aeneas, and he had this idea, which turned out to be correct, that. Virgil was going to make something of that genealogical link between him, Augustus, and, uh, and, the, uh, and the hero. Uh, there is a question whether Augustus was pleased with the result. There's actually a question about whether Virgil was pleased with the result. He left instructions on his deathbed that the manuscript of the poem be burned. It was obviously disobeyed. Um, but in any case, it's a fascinating poem, and I hope that you haven't survived. Gilgamesh will appear for that too. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, for continuing to round out our classical education. Andrew has a large following. If you want to take these courses, you're going to have to sign up right away for these as well. Um, now we have, are going to learn something about our local uh, area. And that is uh, Thomas Mays, who's going to teach us about our Bellingham Symphony. Thomas? Good afternoon. Uh, thank you all for a moment of your time. Uh, I'm just curious, could you uh, raise your hand if you've been to the Walker Symphony sometime in the past? Wonderful. All right. Good answer. <laughs> uh, uh, my, again, my name is Thomas Mays. I'm the executive director of the symphony, and I'm also a bass player in the orchestra. Um, I did an undergrad in music performance and have performed in the symphony for about eight or ten years and uh, also then did a master's in arts administration and ended up in the last year uh, in the executive director role. So I kind of crossed both sides. And the course is uh, two dates, as you can see, and it's really an exploration of not only what makes our local symphony unique and, and um, so well supported in our community, but it's about the symphony orchestra field in general and how we connect with that. Um, uh, for those of us that follow the field, obviously there's been a lot of up and downs with symphonies around the country, especially professional symphonies with labor lockouts and, and declining audiences and a lot of conversations that, that lead people to believe 
that classical music is dying. That's been said for many years. Uh, but if Bellingham is any indication, that is, that is not the case. We have been seeing great support from our community, and this is a way to explore uh, what it is that makes our symphony really a part of the cultural fabric of, of Bellingham and Whatcom County. Um, the first course on October 2nd will really be an exploration of the history of the organization. We're coming up on a 40th anniversary for the symphony, so talking about how it started and how it's evolved since, um, as well as some of the unique features of our orchestra and the people who make it what it is. Um, in between these two courses, it's not listed there specifically, but for those of you who sign up for the course, we actually have a concert of the symphony on October 12th, which is a Sunday. And so for those of you who sign up, we're going to invite you on October 11th, which is a Saturday, to come join us at part of the dress rehearsal for the symphony. So in the first course, we'll talk a bit about the context, and then you'll be invited to come observe part of our dress rehearsal. And then on the October 16th date, we'll do some wrap up of what you saw, questions you may have had, experiences, and then again, broaden it out and talk about the future of the field in general and how we uh, here locally can play an active role in continuing to foster classical music and music appreciation here and throughout um, the country. So I hope you will uh, join us for that and thanks for the time. Thank you, Kevin. Now, um, our longtime film guru and very popular uh, instructor, Ron Miller, is back again. He's going to tell you about two classes he has this time. The first one, Cultural Revolution in Film, the 1950s. Ron? I know a lot of you are probably thinking, what's he talking about? We know that Cultural Revolution really happened in the 60s. Well, I got a lot of surprises for you. Uh, the 50s were not the benign quiet time that we thought. I mean, we went to war in Korea. The space age was launched with Sputnik in 1957. Uh, President Eisenhower sent federal troops to integrate schools in Arkansas, I mean in Alabama. And uh, I think it's a, it's a situation where uh, you want to look a lot closer and it's going to be kind of a nostalgia trip for a lot of us, I think, who, who grew up or lived in the 50s. Uh, for instance, uh, the culture was really radically changed. Um, it was the time when television came and, and it replaced uh, radio as the prime entertainment force in America. A lot of the radio programs were turned into TV programs. And the, the box office for Hollywood movies uh, in 1950 was the lowest it had been since 1933 in the heart of the Depression. The studio system was collapsing. Their stars were becoming independent because they were all laid off. They couldn't afford to pay them anymore. And uh, they became independent producers. This changed everything. And at the same time, uh, a, a little known Cuban <coughs> band leader named Desi Arnaz revolutionized television by filming I Love Lucy and putting that uh, into a situation where it could be syndicated around the country in, in repeats. Before that, television was all live. And it was, it was filmed off the TV screen, which was a very poor imitation of movies. So Arnaz changed the whole future of television in the 1950s. Uh, Hollywood tried to deal with this, and they, they came up with the 3D revolution in, in the early 50s, then the widescreen uh, time. And we're going to do a lot of things to try to show you what this was like. For instance, I, I would paint a copy of the famous roller coaster sequence from This is Cinerama, the 1952 thing, and we're going to see that on the big screen that we have at the library presentation room. I'm going to show you the first uh, uh, film in Cinemascope, The Row. The first film in this division, White Christmas, and the, the Todd A.O. version of Oklahoma. These are all widescreen things that finally resulted in the kind of widescreen that we have today in the movies. In music, for instance, the big band era came to a close, and you had the coming of rock and roll in, in what we used to be called Western music, and the singing cowboys disappeared, and it came to television first and then disappeared. And at the same time, you had the rockabilly artists you know, like Buddy Holly and Elvis Presley that came along and joined the rock and roll revolution. And in, in uh, the situation of jazz, for instance, the, the, uh, the bebop people came along in uh, the African American community. And then you had the cool jazz era of Dave Brubeck, the modern uh, jazz quartet, and those people that, that appealed to the college audience. There was this huge idea of revolution going on in our culture at that time. And of course, 
Hollywood had to deal not only with the fact that they had to divest themselves of all their movie theaters under federal uh, order, but uh, they had all the foreign films finally coming in. Europe had recovered, and Japan had recovered from World War II, and they were making films, and they were now playing in America and bringing a whole new cultural revolution in terms of candor on the screen. It was the era of Brigitte Bardot, and it was the era of all of the Scandinavian films that had nudity and had topics that had never been discussed in American movies before. So Hollywood had to deal with this, and they began to go into issues. And you had the civil rights struggle on film, and you had all kinds of wonderful new things that they had never taught the American audience before through film. Now, I think we're going to have a lot of fun with this, and the first episode is going to deal with just the revolution of 1950, and you'll be amazed at how many amazing things happened in 1950. We're going to finally show some of the greatest film, clips from the greatest films of that decade. Now my second class is one that's going to interrupt the 50s thing for one Saturday, and that will be on October 25th. And it is, well, there will be some information there, but it will be mostly fun. Uh, in fact, I will be joining my sidekick, technical man, Joey Coldblazer, to a dressing costume. And we invite everyone to come in costume. It's a pre-Halloween festival of fright. And it's a celebration of the great horror films of the 1930s, when all of the famous monsters that we now love so well uh, came first to our screens. Frankenstein's monster, uh, Dracula, and uh, the Invisible Man, the Mummy, all of these things. And we're going to show you some amazing stuff you probably have never seen before. Among them, uh, Lon Chaney Sr.'s only talking movie, 1930. You know, he was signed to play Dracula on the screen because it had been a big Broadway hit, but uh, he died. And they had to reach out to Bela Lugosi to play the part of Dracula. It became an enormous hit. And here in the 30s, when nobody had enough money to buy food, they were flocking to the movie theaters to see monsters and werewolves and mummies come to life and what have you. You're going to see some amazing stuff and we're going to have a lot of fun. So I hope you join me for both of these courses and uh, we always have a lot of fun discussing this stuff too. So please join us. That is going to be a really fun class. I'm going to be there because you won't recognize me. <laughs> Um, dealing with radioactive waste at Hanford. Um, uh, we have three people that are going to be uh, uh, teaching this class, but we have Jan Cantrell here today to talk to us. Thank you. Good afternoon. We're going to be talking about waste-related issues at the Hanford Nuclear Reservation in Richland, Washington. How many people knew that this is like the most radioactive contaminated place in the world? Yeah, in our state of Washington. I mean, we have Fukushima now to worry about, but this radioactive waste site has been there since World War II and a lot of money and expertise is going into trying to solve this problem. The class is in three sessions. The first session is going to be taught by myself. Um, I'm not really any kind of radiation expert, but when I was working for the Customs and Border Protection, I worked for the International Training Program where we hosted international delegations who came over to Hanford to learn more about radiation issues and also how to interdict radiation at the borders. So I'm going to be teaching a pretty basic class that I call Radiation 101 and I'll be talking a little bit about the issues at Hanford but mostly I want to familiarize you with the concepts and the vocabulary so you'll be ready for the real stars when they come the following week. So on the se second session, Dieter Borman is going to be here to talk to you. He is uh, 
an alumnus of Western, and he is now the uh, public involvement officer who works for the Washington State Department of Ecology. So he really is a public information officer, and he will have a lot to say about uh, radiation waste in general and some of the contaminated sites around the Hanford Reach. And on the third day, the 30th of October, Mr. Dan McDonald is coming, who is one of the managers for the tank waste project at Hanford. And he will have some very specific information about the challenges of dealing with the uh, radioactive waste tanks over at Hanford that we've heard so much about on King 5 News. So I uh, look forward to seeing you there and join us for this, what should be a very informative class. Thanks. Our next speaker, Dan Froelich, also could not be here today. I tell you, I'm gonna be a naturalist in my next life so I can see the world. He's in Death Valley teaching a bird class. But I got an email from him yesterday and he said that uh, it is pouring, absolutely pouring rain there. So I emailed him back and said he should have stayed home. It's beautiful. <laughs> Um, his class is going to be on avian singles club, mating strategies of birds. And he also sent me a little bird to read to you. Albatrosses that make for life, polar finches in which females incubating eggs are fed on the nest by their partnered mates, acorn woodpecker families that include non-social, uh, that include parental helpers at the nest, bird domestic lives were long viewed as a model for human uh, social morality until scientists began unraveling the scandalous hanky-panky that goes on behind the scenes. <laughs> Avian mating strategies run the gamut of possible scenarios from long-term monogamy um, to mating units which include multiple males and females. Um, Birds of either sex may contribute no more than their genetic code or as much as a year or more of one-on-one -on -one parental care for their offspring. We'll consider the ecological and evolutionary pressures that favor one approach over the other. Where about when uh, polygamy makes sense, why some birds mate for life, and who benefits from the lucking behavior. That is where females select mates from among um, multiple males displaying all of their finery. Um, that sounds like fun, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, and so he and I both hope that we'll see you at this class. Uh, those of you that took his class before, he comes all the way from Fallsco for us, but uh, he really enjoys teaching to us and uh, it will be a very interesting class. Now we have Adam Moles. Adam is one of our curricular, uh, curriculum committee members and has quite an extensive education in several fields. This is the first class he's given, but it's going to be uh, on Arthurian legends. Adam? Hi, I teach infectious diseases up at Western, but uh, at the time I was 20, I was reading a tale by Chaucer that was freaking hilarious and ended with the lesson that if you really want a happy marriage, you've got to let the wife make all the decisions. <laughs> and since then, it embraced more and more of the Arthurian, went even to Oxford, picked up a PhD in the subject. It's just one of those things where it's just plain fun. Almost every one of the tales are focused on idealism, how the world should be as opposed to how the world is, and the struggles that the knights make in trying to reconcile social values with this idealistic viewpoint. Sometimes because they are simply human, they fail. 
but the process of fighting monsters, dragons, uh, rescuing maidens, uh, just that whole panoply of let's go on an adventure, let's go out into the wilderness, and suddenly you're separated from societal values and you just simply have to make do. The character of the individual knight suddenly becomes illuminated, the problems with the societal values become starkly contrasted, but mostly they're just absolute fun. And this was a period where women were actually the ones who were paying the poets to write this stuff. So we'll go everywhere, hopefully, from some of the early Duke Borum, uh, Arthur is just running around in woad, fighting the Saxons, all the way on up to Monty Python, and in the process, hoping that you'll have some guy to all these complex tales. Which are the ones that, if you could only read one, what would you go for? If you're only interested in the modern takes, what do you do? Which movies are actually accurate representations of the medieval tales, and which ones are, oh my god, uh, spoiler alert, Monty Python. Uh, so we're just sort of hoping to give you some of the joy that I had sitting around in these seminars where instead of a lecture, it was really just everybody experiencing the stuff together and finding the essentially the hilarity of literature. Thanks. Adam has a wonderful sense of humor. I'm sure you will enjoy his class very much. The next class, uh, American Colonial Life 1620 to 1776, is the second in a series of four classes on U.S. history given by Richard Millet. Um, he continues to correct all of the myths that we all learned as students in, uh, while we were coming up in school. And he'll tell us all about that. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, is Abe still here? The, I am so happy that you are foraging here in the state of Washington. Because where I come from in the state of New York, poison ivy would find you before you find it. <laughs> um, I am not going to deal with politics in this class. I'm not going to deal with the Boston Tea Party or the American Revolution or the Constitution. What I'm going to be taking a look at are is the social structure in the various colonies, who held power and sway in the various colonies, um, it's kind of interesting that the northeastern colonies were quite different from Virginia and they were quite different from Delaware and Pennsylvania. And then of course you had the Irish Scott uh, area along the spine of the Appalachian uh, backlands. Uh, we'll be talking about food. I've discovered that there's a rumor going around that colonists had popcorn with milk in a bowl for breakfast. Um, and other interesting edibles. Um, I'll be talking about the interaction between uh, the colonists and Native Americans and cultural objects and materials that went back and forth between them to benefit each group. Um, so it's always a fun class. I, uh, I had to drop eight pounds to, <laughs> to get into my uh, outfit here. Uh, this was created when I was teaching U.S. history in the 11th grade in Seattle at Nathan Hale High School. And, you know, the modern kids, you know, you got to grab their attention somehow. So I would come in in costume, but I kind of developed this little pillow here. Uh, we'll be talking about clothing and why people had no left or right feet, okay, back in the colonial days, and different types of material that they used to make clothing and um, stone walls, and we'll even, even investigate why, if you notice some of these uh, early colonies right here, why the east-west boundary lines are absolutely straight. But golly, what happened to the other vertical boundaries? There's a reason why they're all squiggly, and that's only east of the Mississippi. You go west of the Mississippi and boundary lines of states, Wyoming, Colorado, Montana, they all have right angle boundaries, and then we'll investigate that. So I hope you come. This is uh, the second in my series, and I always have a fun class, and I have to say, I am always, always amazed at how well read the people in my class are. Every now and again, I will find 
some obscure point and I'll bring it out and I'll see some deep, three or four heads going. <laughs> and it's like they, they already knew it, they've already found it. Thank you. Todd Donovan is our next instructor and he's going to teach a course on the 2014 congressional election. Um, I promise you we'll learn a lot about U.S. politics from this class. Todd? Similar to U.S. Congress, it's not a very good a solid class. Um, <laughs> actually, if you, uh, if, there's a paradox I want to look at in this class. Um, it, it's mostly just going to be about the 2014 election, or maybe the second part, but the first day, but there's a paradox that congressional approval of the United States Congress today, if you had to guess, you know, pick, pick the number of Americans percent who approved the job performance of Congress. Yes, yeah, it's, it's in single digits now. I mean, yeah. Toxic waste at Hanford's going to pull better than that, probably. <laughs> and you're getting down to just, you know, their friends and neighbors and family and staff members. But then they'd also guess what percentage of incumbents will get reelected? 98, 95, something like that in the House. So how do, how do we unpack that? You know, and there's, there's a lot of expectations or assumptions about what might be going to the gerrymandering, is it campaign finance? Is it something new? You know, what's changed recently? The Citizens United case has come along. How has that maybe changed campaign finance? But how do we explain this disjuncture between that you know, incredibly low approval and, and high election rates? Um, and you know, one of the projects, you know, the first session before the election, I'll have, you know, people can do predictions. I'll give my predictions. If they're anywhere close, I'll come back for the second session. <laughs> um, but I'll have, you know, I'll give you the tools to do that stuff as well, and then also like this online tool where you can do your own gerrymandering. There's some pretty really powerful online software that's just point and click, and we can test that gerrymandering hypothesis, like how hard or easy is it to really draw the lines so you can tweak the outcomes of elections. It's actually kind of harder, harder than you think, but we'll talk about that. Um, and then maybe we'll look at how those things do or don't explain the outcome, because the second meeting is a Thursday, so that's two days after the election. Um, I also want to look at the, uh, the another kind of paradox is you know, the House is as polarized, the Senate is as polarized as it's ever been ideologically. Is the electorate? I mean, does, does that rep represent what voters are thinking? And there's there's a disjoint there. How do we how do we explain that? Uh, what is it that's predictable about midterm elections? And that's changed. It used to be we'd say the incumbents become a president's party should lose that 15, 20 seats just historically since the Civil War. Um, that's probably not going to happen this time. Like, wh why is that and, and what's changed? And then last, um, if, if this is a problem, that these elections aren't competitive, they don't actually reflect the public that much, what can we change? Uh, what kind of reforms, proportional representation, different ways of doing districting, uh, different ways of doing primaries, different ways of doing voting. Uh, and I, I, this is, I'm an elections geek. This is the stuff I study. I work on federal court cases with this stuff. I'm going to Scotland tomorrow because they have a really exciting referendum. Um, <laughs> and I'll be back. We're classic of Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dave Rader is another new uh, uh, instructor for us. Um, he is uh, has recently moved here from California. In fact, he just moved here this summer. But uh, before he even got here, he emailed me and said that he wanted to uh, teach ALL classes. He taught them before in many places, including UW. And so we are going to have this very dynamic speaker come in and teach us a class on Theodore Roosevelt, American president and global leader. He uh, has really studied Theodore Roosevelt in depth, and I'm sure we'll learn a lot. Well, thank you uh, very much for having me. Um, I've uh, taught modern American history for 40 years, and uh, my wife Susan and I uh, both uh, do uh, World Cloud Rotary presentations. We've done 46, this is our 46 uh, TR presentation in the last year. And, uh, uh, but this is the short, <laughs> most, most of them will be 30 minutes and, uh, and three hours. Our class is going to be three, uh, three two hour sessions. We're going to cover Teddy Roosevelt. Um, because Teddy Roosevelt's my favorite American, and I hope to make you make your favorite American also. And uh, uh, I got interested in Teddy Roosevelt uh, in 1990, uh, actually before then, but in 1990, 
I was giving uh, uh, history classes on board the USS Carl Vinson when we came into the Philippines, and just at that time we were studying the Philippine insurrection. And we'll get into the Philippine insurrection in the second class during, uh, during Roosevelt's uh, uh, presidency. But Susan and I had a lot of help this time, uh, as you probably know. Uh, what's happening Sunday? PBS, yes. PBS special, right? Uh, with Ken Burns. And Susan and I went to see Ken Burns in, in Seattle uh, last week, and he talked about the three Roosevelt's. And uh, that's TR and who else? No one more who else? FDR, right? And uh, how are they related? Cousins. Cousins. FDR is, is, is TR's fifth cousin once removed. Who is Elmer? His wife, right? What's the relation to Teddy? Niece. Niece. Okay. So we have a lot of help. And watch this because our, our program will be a little more in depth, certainly not more in depth than Ken Burns because he's great. But uh, uh, we'll discuss it more at length uh, about Teddy Roosevelt. The reason we do this, and the reason I do this with uh, the, uh, the Rotary Clubs, my goal was to have everyone compare, I'm glad we're having a political class, a couple of political classes, compare our contemporary leaders, our contemporary dynasties, so to speak, the Clintons and the Bushes, right? Are they the best that America can offer? And should we be comparing with, with TR, and I say, or FDR, or Elmer, and I say yes. And that's what we're, that's what the, the primary goal that, uh, of our class. Oh, 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 you guys can steal four or five, right? So that's what we're, that's what we're going to talk about. Um, and, uh, and Ken Burns uh, watches his program. He'll probably have two, two uh, segments on, uh, on TR. And uh, he's going to ask you questions. If you, know, if you enjoy your social security check, if you enjoy uh, uh, pure food and drug, if you enjoy uh, uh, most of the benefits, progressive benefits that FDR and Woodrow Wilson brought in, uh, conservation, right? Uh, what else can you, can you think about? Mm -hmm. Child labor, labor unions. Uh, uh, the list goes on. It all started with Teddy Roosevelt. All began with Teddy Roosevelt. And it was uh, brought into being by uh, Woodrow Wilson and uh, FDR. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Chocolate, chocolate, chocolate. This is going to be a really fun class. It's just a one session class. Uh, Hat couldn't be here today because uh, it was just too much time away from work, I'm afraid, for her to come up from Seattle. But she is from Theo Chocolate. She is going to. Um, teach us all about chocolate from the beans and where they're picked and fair trade um, all the way up through the processing and the different kinds of chocolate, um, why cho chocolate is so good for your heart. You'll find it on the top 10 list of every uh, uh, health food list, um, good reasons to eat chocolate. And uh, she's also going to bring, she said, lots and lots of samples. So you can find out for yourself which level of chocolate you like best. So we can look forward to that. Our next instructor is Ara Taylor. She is going to do a class she did maybe seven years ago, eight years ago. Scoundrels in Literature and Why We Adore Them. I am really looking forward to this class. I didn't get to see it last time. And uh, we're going to learn a lot about uh, uh, different kinds of literature and the scoundrels in them and why we adore them. <laughs> How's that for under three minutes? <laughs> <laughs> Our next, uh, Dave Tucker could not be here today. Uh, he is our resident geologist and uh, also has a huge following, just an outstanding uh, instructor. He's going to be talking on landslide hazards in Whatcom County. We thought that was a very topical uh, idea and we asked him and he said, oh sure, I can come and talk to you on that. He's going to show you um, just why landslides take place, the different kinds of landslides, um, 
and uh, where what areas are most susceptible to this, and uh, uh, a lot of other things that I'm sure I will learn <laughs> during this class. So uh, please take this one session course, uh, Landslides by Dave Tucker, and I'm sure you'll be glad you did. Okay, Brad Howard. Brad's going to talk to us about media policy and practice, something we all need to know about. Hello. Thank you for having me here today. What a great list of courses to follow. What a lot of hard acts to follow. The good thing about my field is almost every one of those topics is fair game for American journalism. And the policies that shape American journalism go a long way to determine exactly how much we know or don't know about each and every one of those topics. I'm a former ag writer, so when we uh, saw someone gonna talk about farm bills and farm policy, that hit near and dear to me, covering the election. I'm a former political writer for the Quad City Times, another topic very near and dear to me as a former journalist. And so in this course on media policies and media practice, I want to introduce you to the ways in which the policies that we make, with an emphasis on the fact that these policies are constructed, which always implies that if we don't like the way that they're constructed, we can construct them in a way that allows us to achieve a different set of goals as long as we keep our eyes on an Arthurian legend approach to journalism that Teddy Roosevelt would have been familiar with in the form of muckraking journalism, which he meant as an insult, but we took as a great compliment. If we had that kind of journalism that, say, is practiced by Yes Magazine just to the south of us on Cambridge Island, who uh, they do a great job of pointing out how the world could be if we thought about things a little bit differently. But that's not mainstream journalism. So I'll take you back to policy as it is set out in the US Constitution, determining certain things about the news media, where we'll talk about different interpretations, not only from the perspective of the First Amendment and copyright and the postal law, but we'll talk about different interpretations of liberty negative liberty, what is negative liberty, what is positive liberty, and what does that mean to us as we create policies, policies that are important to us if we're going to make decisions at these elections that will serve our own interests as citizens. Those policies then we'll look at in the end as social constructions, and we'll take some time in the end to talk about how we could create a different set of potential policies that would allow us to pursue our goals as a national community, a regional community, or a local community in order to express our values and our actions as a people. So if you're interested in all the great topics that everybody has already introduced and you want to see how we could know and understand those topics better as a people. Please join me in December to talk about media policies and media practices. I look forward to talking to a group of individuals for a change that actually read newspapers. <laughs> <laughs> Most of my students don't. Thank you very much. Bill Young is our next instructor. He has taught one course before, music from around the world, that was very popular. He even uh, brought his very ancient Chinese instrument and played it for us, which we really enjoyed. He? What was the name of that instrument? The Qin, if you like. It's, oh, it's Qin? Qin, but you have to raise your voice. Hi everyone. Um, <clears throat> if you come to my class, you'll be in for a treat. Even though it's not talking, but it's still <laughs> I have 
lots and lots of wonderful images and uh, audio recordings and video recordings of uh, music and dance uh, from the, our neighbors on the other side of the pond uh, to share with you. And um, uh, many of these materials are quite rare. Many of them are privately uh, made, uh, and some are from uh, the, 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 the countries uh, from China, Japan, and Korea. So they are not uh, accessible easily. Uh, and um, uh, they will show the beauty and the creativity of, of, of our neighbors. And I will provide some uh, bits of information to make them more meaningful to you. Uh, uh, I know many of you are world travelers, and I hope my material will bring you fond memories of your uh, travels. Now, these bits of information, let me give you an example. You know, music from different parts of the world can be quite different. And uh, one of the reasons is that the musical instruments are, are quite different. For instance, in sub sub Saharan Africa, uh, the, the, the musicians use a lot of drums. And why is that? Well, part of the reason is that there are lots of forests and woods there, and also there are large wild animals. And both of these are absolutely necessary to make big drums. Uh, so the physical environment is a very important factor uh, that affects a musical culture. And in, uh, in Java, for instance, the Indonesian island, there are lots and lots of volcanoes. The result is that the Javanese uh, music has, uses a lot of metal, because we know uh, uh, metal is, uh, you needs fire uh, to, to shape it. Now, in China, Japan, and Korea, uh, what is the, the, the particular plant that uh, distinguishes uh, their music? Does anybody know? Bamboo, yes, very good. I know you all know that. Now, but the next question is that what is the insect that is even more important than bamboo uh, that distinguishes uh, uh, East Asian music? Now, you. Yes, very good. You, you people are too good. <laughs> because I, I, I was going to say that come to my class and you find out. <laughs> In fact, you, know, <laughs> you already know that. Yes, it's the silk. Uh, silk, uh, silk worm is in the second. Silk is, the, is the, I think we all know it's a uh, beautiful dresses, but it's the most important uh, material for, for these station instruments. So please do come, and I hope I see many of you. Thank you. I don't know if the next uh, topic is serious or not. Extinction, are we next? <laughs> David C. Tucker is going to tell us about that. Okay, um, well, I want to thank you for accepting my proposal on the topic of extinctions. And I want you to know that um, I know the world is depressing the way it is, okay? Uh, there are lots of good things that can come out of a class like this, okay? I promise you. I also promise that there will be discussion time, and um, in all my teaching, teaching in high school and teaching in college, I was always concerned about developing um, an, an attitude of activism amongst my students to care about something and to do something about the world they live in. And that's sort of the direction we will approach in this one. Okay, you all know something about extinctions. You know that the dinosaurs uh, uh, were, became extinct because of an asteroid colliding down in the Yucatan. And before that, the Permian extinction um, about 200 or 250 million years before that, where 99% of all living species uh, became extinct. Okay, so you know something about past extinctions. Well, I want to fo focus in this course also on the present situation, and that is that um, many scientists in any uh, field related to biodiversity, uh, geography, <coughs> Uh, agriculture and so on, they all agree that we're, we have entered a period called the Anthropocene, which is an extinction event. 
And so uh, we want to focus on that because that's the one we can do something about. I mean, I would like to know about the Anthropocene. You know, I'm sitting at the table in the, uh, the morning and reading the Bellingham paper and I notice my name in the obituary column. And, uh, and uh, you know, I'd like to know what I can do about this. Uh, are my friends going to go with me? Should I pack my swimsuit? What, what, what should I do? Okay. Well, that's sort of the idea here. Uh, on, on a serious note, we're going to examine data. This is going to be a very data-driven uh, course. And like I said before, in preparing for this class, I uh, uh, came across resources that um, really started to tie me into the emotional part of it. I've always cared about the environment. I've always taught environmental chemistry. But now it's different. It's, we really need to do something. We're going to examine topics like um, biodiversity, um, population. Uh, by 2050, there will be 9 billion. 10 years later, there will be 10 billion. Um, Let's see, uh, food production. One fellow here was talking about food, food production. Right on the topic there. What can we do to uh, keep us here? Um, greenhouse gases, you're familiar with those. Um, uh, some topics that you may not be familiar with. Uh, ecosystem services. Those are the services, those are the things that nature provide us that we take for granted that are free. And we need to study those things and appreciate them. Um, hidden water. I was not aware that uh, it takes 800 gallons of water to uh, produce one burger. Um, economists call things externalities. We don't include things like water and some of those uh, free resources in our environmental protection and tax statements or anything. We always take it for granted. So uh, you, you owe it to you, you, you owe it to your grandchildren, you owe it to a whole bunch of people for you to uh, become familiar with what scientists mean by this thing called the Anthropocene. Thank you very much. Da, 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 da. Joel Hall is going to uh, Joel Hall is going to talk to us about Beethoven, his music, and his life. Um, you won't, you won't have any trouble hearing this one. <laughs> Offstage solo of the Lenore Overture Number Three. It was the fourth overture uh, Beethoven wrote the opera Fidelio. Uh, why would a composer write four different overtures for the same opera? Well, I don't want to answer that. <laughs> we're going to look into that. Um, my inspiration for this course came from Edmund, Edmund Morris's book um, Beethoven, the Universal Composer. Uh, he was in a unique, unique position to write this book because not only is he a world class uh, um, biographer, uh, wrote a biography on Teddy Roosevelt, <laughs> um, he uh, wanted the, he aspired to be a concert pianist. He studied to be a concert pianist. So, because of that, his descriptions um, of Beethoven's music is, is actually superb. And they're not, um, they're not, Musically, they're, they're good for lay people. They're, they're really easy to understand. I'm, I was really uh, impressed by that. Um, as in the book, we'll be looking into Beethoven's life, uh, his politics, his times. Um, for example, uh, I have to read that. But for example, at one point, uh, Beethoven considered dedicated his third symphony to Napoleon Bonaparte. 
Uh, but when his piano student, Ferdinand Ries, informed him that uh, Bonaparte had just recently uh, crowned himself emperor, uh, Beethoven blew into a rage and said, is he too an ordinary human being? And then went directly to the manuscript uh, for the symphony and tore up the first page, which had dedication on it, and threw it to the floor. And later he came back and put a, another page on it that said, uh, uh, with Sinfonia Eroka uh, School on it, which means Eroka Symphony. Uh, Beethoven's personal life was interesting. Uh, it seemed like he was attracted to women who were already married. We talked about that a little bit. Uh, he struggled with deafness. Uh, his struggle with deafness began early and weighed on him heavily. What could be more annoying than trying to write great music and uh, be losing your hearing every day, getting worse and worse until you're reduced to just communicating with uh, uh, conversation books? In other words, people come in and write down a question and you uh, write an answer. So, um, most of our time, though, will be spent listening to and discussing, in my opinion, the greatest composer of all time. Um, we will be uh, listening to a lot of music. Uh, he's, his greatest achievements are, uh, such as the Fifth and Ninth Symphony, are known today across, across the globe, and also da 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 da. <laughs> but also, I want to spend a lot of time hoping to open people up to uh, the idea that. Uh, uh, or listening to other great works that he wrote that aren't so, pop aren't so popular and well known, such as uh, quartets, pianos, pop, sonatas, and cantatas. Come to my class, we're going to have a great time. Thank you. That basically wraps it up for us. One last little announcement that I'll make on behalf of the excursion committee, the excursion chair, and that is if you're interested in the Mile Post 31 excursion, Please sign up soon. The deadline is coming up very quickly on that as well. And thanks for coming today. <laughs>